let's continue to talk about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, but this time let's focus specifically on racism. When you look at studies that examine the laws that we have passed in our society over the past several decades, public opinion polls, sociological research, psychological research, all of the evidence converges to show that racial prejudice and discrimination have been decreasing in our country and in other countries over the past several decades. Let me give you an example. Look at some research from back in 1933. This is a tracking study that looks at people and how they change over time. When white participants were asked about some traits that black Americans have, a lot of people said that they see them as superstitious, lazy, happy-go-lucky, and even ignorant, which is a pretty dismal view um, of another group of people. But you see, in 1993, very few people thought that black Americans had those types of traits. Things have changed, of course, over time. Things aren't perfect, but things have changed over time. When you look at, again, a study that looks at data over the past several decades, when you ask people if they approve or disapprove of a marriage between blacks and whites, back in the 50s, very few people approved. But by 2013, nearly 9 out of 10 people surveyed approved of interracial marriage. So again, that's not perfect, but it's clearly a step in the right direction. So although there is good reason to celebrate, it's clear if you just look out into the street, if you just read some news, that racism remains a fact of life in America and abroad. As times have changed, so have the ways in which racism is exhibited in our culture. So for example, an old fashioned or old school type of racism is really very blatant, it's explicit, Sometimes we call it overt racism. It's unmistakable when you see it. We don't see it often anymore, but if you think back and you look at a picture like this, we used to hear about the Klan burning crosses in people's yards, and that was clearly an attempt at um, intimidation, trying to get people to understand, if you don't look like us, if you're not one of us, we don't want you in this area. Now that type of overt old school racism has given way to another type of racism, a more of a modern racism. It's tougher to detect. It's, it's much more subtle. It's very easy to rationalize, and that's why it's hard to sometimes put your finger on it. However, it is very impactful. Let's go through a couple examples so you have a sense of what I'm talking about. Sometimes we're able to detect modern racism through research. So here's a research study. The participants were all teachers. And they were told about a student, and this student was having some behavioral problems. They were led to believe that this student was either white or black. And the way that the researchers manipulated that was by the name of the student. So the student either had a stereotypic white name or a stereotypic black name. Now, when the teachers were told about the white students and the black students, when they just heard about one infraction, they didn't feel very troubled about that student and the situation that the student was in. But when they heard about a second infraction, the student was bad again, they essentially lost patience for that black student and they became more troubled. There was a statistically significant difference here. And the same thing was found when they had to recommend or not recommend disciplinary action. After just one infraction, there was no difference between the white and the black students. But after another infraction, the white teachers essentially lost their patience with the black students and they were more likely to recommend disciplinary action. So you can see here, this is very tough to really put your finger on unless we're studying it in a very systematic way like it was studied in this experiment. And what was found essentially was that the white teachers had somewhat of an intolerance for the black students and their bad behaviors. Now, another way in which racism is exhibited in a more modern way has to do with access to housing. Now, what you see in front of you is an example of clearly overt racism. Here is an example of where someone made uh, a reservation at an Airbnb place. So it's basically an apartment or a room that the person wanted to rent probably on a vacation. And when you're a member of Airbnb, you create a profile and your profile includes a picture. So in this particular situation, the person made a reservation and then the host, the person who owns the room, wrote back and said, I'm going to cancel your reservation. Um, and they used the N-word and they said, I hate you people. And uh, you're in the South and you're going to have to find another place to rest during your vacation. Now, what's much more likely 
is a much more modern way in which instead of being so explicit and saying that they hate you type of people, they would simply write back and say, I'm sorry, there was a mistake and this room is no longer available. Do you see what I'm getting at there? That's a more modern type of racism where it's much more hard to put your finger on it. It's hard to determine exactly what's going on, but there have been some studies using Airbnb where the researchers manipulated the uh, person who's in the picture of the profile. And they found that when the profile picture is African-American, people are more likely to get their reservations canceled. This is an example of what I would call retail racism. And again, this was a really good, well-controlled study. The researchers trained males and females, white and black, to go into a car dealership and try to get the best price um, for a particular type of car. And this car cost dealers about $11,000. And as I mentioned, the people were all trained to negotiate in a particular way. So that was controlled in terms of how they were dealing with the, the dealership and the salesperson. And you can see here that white males ended up getting the best price. Um, black males and black females got the worst price. So there's a systematic bias in the way that the dealerships we're dealing with the customers. This would be an example of modern racism. Um, we even noticed this type of thing with sentencing. Uh, there was a really interesting study done in which women who were all imprisoned in North Carolina um, were assessed based on how they look. And we can categorize people in a variety of different ways. What you see in front of you are two black women. But the woman on the left is more stereotypically black in terms of her features compared to the woman on the right. And what was found in this situation is that women who had more stereotypically black features were more likely to have long prison sentences. Again, for any individual case, it would be hard to put your finger on it and say that it has to do with racism. But when we look at things overall in a relatively well-controlled research study, we can see that there's some type of systematic bias. That would be an example of modern racism. Now, aversive racism is something related, and it really highlights this duality between a person's egalitarian attitudes and potential unconscious or unrecognized negative feelings that people might have about race. And this is because people's attitudes are very complex. So rationally, someone might think that all people are equal and that black people, white people, and people of other races all deserve the same rights and they all deserve the same opportunities in our society. However, they still might harbor some somewhat racist views, particularly about things that are very close to them. So for example, even though they have a relatively egalitarian view of people of other races, they might think, but I don't want a black neighbor or I don't want my son to be dating a black girl, something like that. That would be an example of aversive racism. So there are a couple things that I want you to take away um, from this particular section. One is that although a lot of these biases are very difficult to see, they do materialize in the real world quite often and really in a wide range of settings. We talked about several of them. And their long-term cumulative effect and impact can really be profound. Let me show you an example of a quote that sums this up pretty well. This is from Samuel Jackson. He says, people know about the Klan and about overt racism, but the killing of one's soul, little by little, day after day, is a lot worse than someone coming to your house and lynching you. That's pretty strong stuff. That's some pretty deep emotion right there. Now, that just highlights what we call microaggressions. And the examples we talked about, about being discriminated against um, in terms of housing, being discriminated against in terms of your retail opportunities, we would call those microaggressions. And even though they might be small, if they're occurring daily, that adds up and has a profound effect. Second takeaway message from this particular section is that modern racism um, can be exposed, even though it's very subtle, when we look at long-term trends and when we look at well-controlled experimentation. So yeah, it's tough to detect, but we can detect it. Well, we discussed overt racism and modern racism and uh, aversive racism. Let's talk a little bit about implicit racism. Implicit racism is really very subtle. You might not be aware of it at all, and you can't control it. It's unconscious. It's unintentional. 
So it's, it's obviously very subtle. And if it's subtle, we need to use some indirect techniques to measure it. And one technique that has gotten a lot of attention because it's really very good is the Implicit Association Test, or IAT. If you Google IAT, you can find a link to go over to Harvard's website where they have that on their server. And you can take the IAT and um, better understand what I'm about to talk about. So let me walk you through how the test would work. When the test begins, you're given some basic instructions. And you're told that you're essentially going to be asked to classify some words or categorize some words. So some of those words are going to be good. Words like joy, love, peace. Everybody would agree that those are good concepts or good categories. Some of those words are going to be bad. Agony, terrible, horrible. Everybody would agree it's easy to categorize those words as bad. Furthermore, you're going to see pictures of faces. Some of those faces are African-American. And it'll be clear when you see those faces. And some of those faces will be European American or white American. And it will be clear when you see those faces. And then you're told to put your fingers on your keyboard by the E and the I, you know, your left hand and your right hand, so that you can make your selection regarding good and bad words or African faces and European faces. You'll see what I mean in just a second. So for example, let's say the word failure comes up. That's obviously a bad word. So I would hit the I, the right side of my keyboard, to show that that's a bad word. And I want to do this as quickly as possible. I have to do it as quickly and accurately as possible for the IAT results to really tell me something about any type of implicit bias I might have. So now here would be an example of where I'm going to see faces. So if I see an African-American face, I'm going to use my left hand to respond on the keyboard. And if I see a white American face, I'm going to respond with my my right hand. So there I see a, a white American face. I'm going to respond with my right hand as fast as I can. So that's the basis for the IAT. But here's where things get interesting. So now there's a mix and it's asking you, are you seeing a face or are you seeing a word? And there I'm seeing a face and that face is African American. But you see, I see there in my vision, it says African American or bad. And let's say I do harbor um, some form of uh, an implicit bias against blacks. That would make sense to me there. That would work. In other words, this would not cause any conflict for people who favor whites over blacks. Because when I see that face, I see it as African American. And here's the kicker. When I see that face, to some extent, I see it as bad. So I'd be able to very quickly respond to that without having any type of inner conflict. But now compare that with when I see something like this. So here, you know, sometimes the, the categories are shifting from left to right. I'm seeing a face that is clearly African-American. But when I look at the headings, the categories, I see on the left African-American and I see good. So although I want to really quickly use my left hand to show that this is an African-American, I also see that word good there. And because if I have some type of bias against blacks, that doesn't make sense to me, it's going to cause some type of a conflict and it's going to slow me down. My response time is going to be longer. So in this case, this will cause a conflict for those who favor whites over blacks. All right, now in the end, it's going to give you some type of an analysis. Now, when I took this test, it told me that the data suggests I have a slight automatic preference for white American relative to African American people. And what that means, we can determine right over here. It says the interpretation shown above is described as automatic preference for black if you responded faster when black faces and good words were classified with the same key as opposed to white faces and good words. It is marked automatic preference for white if you were faster when giving the same response to white faces and good. So the bottom line is, if people see white people as good, they're going to respond more quickly when they see white and good. If people have some type of implicit bias against blacks, they're going to respond quickly when they see black faces and bad words. So the implicit association test is really pretty darn interesting. And it also tends to be um, relatively predictive of true attitudes regarding bias. It's also non-reactive. When I say non-reactive, it simply means that people don't really understand exactly what it's measuring. And that means there's no way that they can really manipulate the results. Um, most people don't take a social psychology class where they actually talk about the ins and outs of the IAT. All right, in this last section, let's talk about interracial interactions. Now, unfortunately, in our society, we have a racial divide.
and that racial divide often leads to very strong feelings of hostility sometimes, and certainly distrust and fear. Let's talk about a couple factors that fuel that. One is really very practical, and that's simply segregation. Blacks tend to live in neighborhoods with other blacks. Whites tend to live in neighborhoods with other whites. Because there's not direct contact, we are less likely to get to know each other, and we tend to distrust and fear those we don't know. So that's kind of a, a more practical concern. This next issue is, is much more social psychological, and that is we live in a society that has racial problems, but interpersonally, we're not really good at dealing with that. And as a result, when we're dealing with people of another race, we often fear appearing racist. And if we fear appearing racist, it's going to change our behavior. And that's because we're going to feel awkward, we're going to be tense, we're going to be anxious. And overall, it might be very cognitively draining. And uh, it might lead to a social interaction that just doesn't feel good. It's just not fun. Also, during interracial interactions, we can activate what are known as meta-stereotypes. Meta-stereotypes are simply describing the fact that we all understand the stereotypes that exist in our culture. So oftentimes, we are thinking about what other people are thinking. So imagine if an African American and a white individual are interacting with each other. And the African American might be thinking, I know there's a stereotype, that there's a difference in intelligence between whites and blacks. In that situation, the African American person might worry about confirming that stereotype. And obviously, if the person is worried about confirming that stereotype, it's going to lead to the same type of interaction I was talking about before, which is awkward, anxious, and generally not enjoyable. So you can see it's, it's easy to see why sometimes people are motivated to avoid interracial interactions. And that obviously wouldn't be a good thing. That would only make matters worse. One way that people deal with this is just to say to themselves, like, well, I'm not going to see race. You know, I'm just going to put that out of my mind. And generally, that doesn't seem to be very helpful because that often leads to a very artificial and disingenuous type of conversation or relationship. I mean, can you imagine having a friend of a different race and you never talk about race, that just would not be a real relationship. And obviously it would become strained because of that. What tends to be much more helpful and more productive is to actually embrace differences and to talk about them and enjoy them and celebrate them. That tends to lead to more intergroup acceptance. It tends to lead to better social interactions overall. And we will talk about some other strategies for um, increasing uh, the positivity of interracial interactions later on this semester. All right, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>